um, talking about the basics of phonology. Uh, there are a lot of folks on the call who have been involved in Ohio's phonology project for years. So we're going to talk about how we use phonology in Ohio, our biological calendar, a little bit about the history of phonology. Uh, we're going to walk through the bees year, looking at different plants that are key for honeybees. And then we'll talk about some ways that you can use phonology in your own beekeeping or bee observations. And we'll try to tie in um, some various methods. I see we have folks really from quite a few different states. Um, a lot of this will be really great for those in the Midwest who can use Ohio's calendar, but I also have some strategies built in for those of you who I see we have Washington State and Maine and some other places. So I'll keep the, um, the chat pod open for just a few minutes, and then I'll switch over to just the PowerPoint. Toward the end of the program, we'll come back, open up the chat pod, so if you have questions, you have a chance to post those in there. I also have a handout that you'll be able to download at the end, so um, you can save that to your computer and I'll refer to it later. Okay? So let's get started. And I want to start really with um, the way phonology started for me. I grew up in western Pennsylvania on the top of a mountain in the Laurel Highlands, and um, as a little girl I would walk up and down uh, the roads and the mountains, and I knew when I saw this plant, the colt's foot, blooming, that spring was finally on its way. One of the very earliest wildflowers, not a native wildflower, but one of the very earliest flowers to bloom in spring, so kind of one of those harbingers of spring that gives us a little hope that spring is actually coming. Um, for 20 years, I was the um, horticulture and natural resources educator with OSU Extension in the Akron-Canton area. So I continued to work with phenology. I did a lot of um, kind of tying Ohio's work in phenology into ornamental pests and plant sequencing, looking at um, different kinds of uh, insects and other um, cultural problems, disease problems that we see in the landscape before it switched over uh, two years ago to the Department of Entomology. I'll talk uh, in a minute about our uh, phenology network here. In Ohio, we have a phenology garden network consisting of about 30 identical gardens, and we're actually um, moving that, kind of transitioning into pollinator phenology. So I'll talk a little bit about that in the end. Now, if you're um, living anywhere near us here in Ohio, you know that spring has been um, a little slow this year. We've had a lot of snow, a lot of really cold events, and I think um, you know, a lot of us are ready for spring to finally get here. And so I think it was March 7th this year, a couple Thursdays ago, that I heard the first male red-winged blackbird call. And to me, that's one of the early indicators that, you know, spring is really on its way. And it happens to coincide, usually, with the bloom of this plant, the skunk cabbage, at a nearby state park. And that really is the essence of phenology. It's the um, correlation between natural events that are fairly dependable from year to year. Those events are um, cyclic in nature, and they're influenced by weather and climate. Um, it's not phrenology. Phrenology is the study of the bumps on your head um, that tells a pseudoscience that tells whether you're a murderer or a liar or on your way to sainthood. Uh, so we're talking about phenology, not phrenology. Phenology is from the Greek word words phaino, which means to show or appear, and logos meaning study. So it's this study of the recurring biological events and how those events uh, sequence through the natural season. Phenology is considered to be one of the oldest sciences. If you think about humans as hunter-gatherers, we had to use our natural environment to know when to move from place to place, when the next crop might be ready, when it's time to harvest the next berries or dig the next root. So we had to use kind of those natural indicators to tell us as a, as a tribe when it's time to pack up and move on. Certainly in early agriculture, phenology was also really important, and some of those sayings, those agricultural sayings have been passed down and used as kind of folk sayings. You've probably heard the saying about planting corn when the oaks ears, is, sorry, when the oak leaf is as big as a squirrel's ear. So there are all kinds of, of little folklore sayings that really have to do with that natural sequencing, that natural timing. Now, interestingly, it's a lot different than when we hear that you should plant peas and potatoes on um, St. Patty's Day. Um, that's really the, uh, a calendar 
um, occurrence, and it really doesn't hold true. If you look at that saying, it's used in California as well as in Alabama as well as in Ohio, and we can be pretty sure that it was different in all those places um, this last Monday. The science of phonology at China actually has the oldest written records of phonology from the 11th century BC. In Japan, the cherry blossom bloom observations have been happening um, since the 9th century AD, and those continue to today. Uh, Carl Linnaeus was a big fan of phonology. He studied the occurrences of spring in 19 different locations in Sweden in the late 1700s. And he and actually uh, Robert Marsham kind of share the um, title of the fathers of phonology. Marsham was a landowner in England who studied and, and noted the natural occurrences on his farm and homestead for, um, for years. And after his death, his family kept up that um, observation actually all the way through 1958. In the US, we have traditions from John Bartram in Philadelphia. Uh, making those observations and keeping those records. Also Henry David Thoreau at Walden Pond, and then more recently, Aldo Leopold. So let's look at Ohio's uh, phonology calendar. We'll talk about how the ca calendar was developed, um, how we use it in Ohio, and how you can adapt it for use where you are. So we're going to spend some time talking about degree days. That may or may not be a new concept for you, and we'll talk about how degree days are calculated and used on our calendar. But the key premise of the work that we do, do here at Ohio State is that the development rate of plants and insects are both temperature dependent. So we know that on a warm spring, insect events and also plant events are faster to occur. Um, and same on a slow spring. We know we're waiting and waiting and nothing's really happening. Those development rates have slowed down because of those temperatures. So let's talk about degree days. Degree days are a measure of accumulated heat in a 24-hour period. And so throughout Ohio, we have weather stations, as you surely do where you live. And these weather stations put data to our OSU computers calculating, among other things, the average daily temperature. So they're taking the minimum and the maximum temperature each day. And, um, and then on a formula, calculating the, a measure of accumulated heat for each of those days. Uh, degree days start over in January. We, at least in the Midwest, we zero out those uh, degree day units in January. So um, from January on, we're kind of waiting for the first warm day. Our measure is 50 degrees. That's called our base unit. So we consider a day that has temperatures above 50 degrees as a day that can accumulate those degree day units. And we're just making the assumption that if the temperature is below 50, degree day units are not accumulating. Um, that's not necessarily true, right? That's just kind of our scientific assumption. But we're studying about 45 different insects and about 75 different plant taxa. And we don't know the specific minimum temperature for each of those organisms, right? Some of them we may know. Let's say we know a certain insect is active at 32 degrees and above. Another may be 42 degrees and above. But we can't plug those specific temperatures. They're just not known for all the plants and insects that we study. And so we just make this grand assumption that below 50 degrees, uh, development is not occurring. Uh, my example of the skunk cabbage shows that that's not true, because we could have no day is above 50, and still the skunk cabbage is going to emerge, even pushing through ice and snow to bloom. So if you're comparing the, the study that we do in Ohio to degree day units that you find closer to home, depending on where you're from, you want to know what the base unit in is. Because if they're not using a 50 degree base temperature, then you're really comparing apples to oranges. You need to find a, um, a calculation that uses that similar base unit. So just a quick example. Um, and here in my example on March 6th, we had a high of 60 and a low of 40. So what's important to know about this example is that we never use a temperature below our base in the calculation of an average daily temperature. So that's basically saying that development is not going backwards right, when it's cold. Um, so we're never using a temperature below our base. So when we calculate that March 6th average temperature, we're using, instead of 40, uh, we're using 60 degrees plus 50 as the low, 
Uh, we're dividing it by 2. We get our average daily temperature of 55. We subtract the base, which is 50, and we get then 5 degree day units that accumulated on March 6th. On March 7th, we had a high of 70, a low of 50. Again, we calculate the average daily temperature. We subtract that base, and we have 10 degree day units that accumulated on March 7th. We add those to the um, degree day units from March 6th, and now we have a running total of 15 degree day units. Something that's really interesting to notice as you uh, watch the calendar and um, hopefully plug in your zip code and watch this progression this spring or track this information yourself is how slowly the degree days accumulate in spring and then how quickly, once the temperatures really rise, once we have those high nighttime temperatures, how quickly our degree day units accumulate. So here's Dr. Dan Herms. He's the chair of our entomology department. Um, and he really developed this phenology calendar that we use in Ohio. For five years at Dow Gardens in Michigan, Dan studied um, and observed several times a week all these insect and plant events. And we'll talk about um, the measures that he used for that. And then when he came to Ohio at Secret Star Arboretum, another five years of data to create this sequence of bloom events and insect activity. And then we had some ways that we uh, were able to validate that information across the state, and I'll share information about that too. So from Dan's work, we have this website. Um, that's our Growing Degree Day and Phenology calendar. It's great news for Ohio participants, but also others who are um, not too far from the Midwest or have similar plant species that you can use the sequence of bloom and compare it to what happens around you. And basically what we're able to do is put in an Ohio zip code. The default date is today's date, but you can also go back in time and find an earlier date. And then you get dropped into the calendar, which we'll look at in just a second. So here we are. Uh, the arrow points about to Worcester. And so if you're from, certainly from Michigan, because Dan has this data compiled from Michigan, um, Kentucky has done some similar phenology studies, um, but we certainly have similar kinds of sequences with Pennsylvania, New York, um, Indiana. You know, you, I think you'll be able to, from a, a fairly wide range, adapt what we do in Ohio. If you're lucky enough to be from Wisconsin or Minnesota, there's a, a really great phenology tradition in the upper Midwest. There are um, some great websites and calendars that are working with all kinds of phenology, so you can uh, link up with those networks where you are. So back to the calendar. Let's um, take a look at how this works. And I put um, our, our zip code here in Worcester, 44691, into the calendar uh, yesterday. And you'll see that it drops this red bar that shows the city. And uh, we had 14 growing degree day units accumulate so far which means basically according to our calendar, right, and it's only these events that we're tracking, but according to these events on our calendar, nothing has happened yet. We haven't had the first bloom of silver maple, which is kind of our first indicator of the year. Um, Cornelia and cherry dogwood are not in bloom. Uh, red maple's not in bloom, etc. As I said, we can go back to previous years. So I put in last year, uh, March 18th last year, or sorry, two years ago, uh, when we had the really warm temperatures. So if you're uh, from Ohio, you'll remember we had some temperatures in the 80s in March, and so things were really accelerated in 2012. So when I put that date back in here, you'll see that in 2012 in Worcester, we had 113 growing degree day units accumulate already. And we already had um, everything above the red bar is what's already happened. So white pine weevil adults had emerged, eastern tent caterpillar eggs had hatched, northern, northern lights forsythia was in full bloom, cornelian cherry dogwood was in full bloom. Everything below the red bar is what's yet to happen. So we were just coming into Norway maple in first bloom and calorie pear in first bloom. So it's a neat illustration how you can use past dates to kind of recreate uh, what might have been happening uh, on a location. We'll come back to that as well. So here's another example. Um, I, I am based in Worcester, but I teach all the way across the state. And so um, here's an example of a day I put the Worcester zip code in. In Worcester, we had Catawba rhododendrons just coming into first bloom, um, just moving into full bloom of black cherry was still yet to come. So we had about 409 
growing degree day units. I should mention that these degree day units that are indicated on the calendar are averages of uh, Dan's data that was collected over those years. So it's not that, you know, if you're calculating this on your own, you know exactly on 409 this event's going to happen. It's around then. Um, it's an average of those degree day units. What, what is really, I think, most powerful about the calendar is that the sequence of events is going to stay the same. So if you just had Catawba rhododendron in first bloom, you know that uh, beauty bush is going into first bloom, uh, black cherry is, is going to come into full bloom, uh, because the sequence of events is um, consistent from year to year. So on this particular day, I was going down to Glendale, which is outside of Cincinnati, to do a program. And you see that in Glendale, they had about 515 growing degree day units. Their Catawba rhododendron was in full bloom, where ours in Worcester was just coming into first bloom. The M that's in the last column um, just gives you more information. So if you're not sure what some of these plants look like, or if you're not sure what some of the pests are, you can click on that, and you'll get a web page that pulls up. Um, telling you more about the plants or a fact sheet about the pest. So because plant development is temperature dependent, we can use the phenological events of plants to track these degree days. Um, we can also use those um, to create a biological calendar. And so what I want to encourage you to do is think about how you can create your own kind of customized biological calendar either based on what we do in Ohio, if that's appropriate, if we have similar plants to what you're growing, or using plants that you're growing but using the same kind of idea. So let me give you an example of how we added on to our phenology calendar in Ohio. In 2006, we had the viburnum leaf beetle move in to Ohio in our upper um, northeastern county, Ashtabula County. This is a defoliating beetle that is a larva and then as an adult, can fully defoliate mostly our native viburnums and uh, can kill shrubs definitely in a season because it defoliates them twice. So the upper left-hand image is of a twig and it shows the um, egg scars that the female makes in the twig. She lays about 10 eggs in each of those little pits and those are how the insect overwinters. Okay, so when this was new to Ohio, we wanted to add the event to our calendar, but we needed to know when do those eggs hatch out and the larvae come out and start to feed on the leaves, which you see down in, in uh, Gaylord's picture there. These little tiny kind of yellowish uh, larvae. And so what Dan and I did is we took twigs that had the egg, um, the egg marks in them, and we put them inside nylon hose. We clipped them onto branches out in the landscape and watched those uh, a couple times a week, watching for when those eggs hatch out. So the way that um, you know, degree days work, we wouldn't want to bring those into the lab and have those hatch out in the you know, 72 degree conditions in the lab. That's not going to give us an accurate representation of what's happening out in nature. So we clipped those outside and waited. And what happened was it just happened to coincide with the full bloom of Korean spice viburnum, which you see pictured in the lower uh, right-hand corner. We weren't really looking for a viburnum as the, the indicator plant, but it just happened um, to be the, a really good um, link to the hatching of those viburnum leaf beetle eggs. So we were, add, we were able to add this event to the calendar. And as you see, if you skip up a, a couple bars from the viburnum leaf beetle, you'll see Korean spice viburnum in full bloom at around 205 growing degree days and about 210 growing degree days for the viburnum leaf beetle. The events that we're taking note of, we're using first bloom and full bloom in our Ohio observations. First bloom is when the first flower on a cluster, or the first individual flower, say of a Rose of Sharon, opens to fully expose the sexual parts. Full bloom, we say, is when 95% of those flower buds have opened. So one out of 20 of the buds remain closed. And that just helps us pinpoint that event a little better. So when we come back to the ideas of how you can track your own phenology, um, you want to think of having a very specific event that you're tracking. So is it the first bloom? Is it full bloom? And what's your definition of full bloom? If you say 100% of the flowers open as full bloom, it's, it's kind of tough to 
really delineate when that happens. Sometimes full bloom can, you know, if the temperatures aren't really high, you may have full bloom of a plant for a couple weeks. So pick an indicator that really has a specific time that you can mark more clearly. So we're going to take a, a quick walk through the bees year and look at some plants that um, have this sequence of bloom. And I think this is really some of the power of phenology for beekeepers. Um, not so much for the development rate of the honeybee, because as we know, since honeybees can generate their own heat in the, in the colony, they're going to be, they're not so temperature dependent for development. We'll look at a few insects that are very temperature dependent, and I think you'll see the distinction there. But the power for beekeepers is the plant sequence, uh, which plants are in bloom, uh, which, where the honey flow is, which, uh, what the timing is for putting your honey supers on. Um, to me, that's really the power of phenology for beekeepers. So we know that if we're trying to have uh, varietal honey, we want to know when different plants are in bloom, this example for uh, blueberry honey. And from a, a, a bee care perspective, we want that season-long bloom. And so if we're adding plants into the farm or to the landscape, we want to think about how our plants bloom in sequence throughout the season, giving bees something to forage on all throughout the year. So uh, I started with skunk cabbage. We'll come back to skunk cabbage. I was at a, a big bee program here in Worcester a couple weeks ago. And I had a couple beekeepers uh, who I, we had a little microscope uh, room set up. And they came to tell me that even though it was really early, this was um, probably about a month ago now, and they live a little bit south of us here in Zanesville, they had bees coming into the hive with pollen on them already, and they wondered what could be blooming. And so we pulled up the calendar for their zip code and saw that, no, they were, they were still pretty early in the season. They shouldn't have any maples blooming yet. Um, and so our best guess was skunk cabbage, because they did live around some natural areas, some wetlands, and um, skunk cabbage does have pollen that bees will gather. Um, then alder coming into bloom, a good pollen source for bees. The maples, an important um, pollen and nectar source for bees. We have red maple and silver maple on our phenology calendar. And it's one of those neat plants that starts out insect pollinated. It has a stickiness to the pollen, but that breaks down over time. So if the insects don't come around or the weather isn't cooperative, that pollen becomes windborne then, and um, the, the plant is hedging its bets for pollination. Cornean cherry dogwood, not a native plant, but one that's really attractive to honeybees. Uh, the willows, along with maples, I think kind of those key pollen sources early in spring, uh, not a real showy flower, but um, a really important bee plant. Then we have some of those early mint weeds, uh, henbit and purple dead nettle, and mints tend to be good nectar sources. So whether you're growing lavender, you're growing thyme, oregano, or some of these weedy mints, um, they're good nectar sources for bees. Dandelion, of course, pollen and nectar, and um, prolific um, throughout the region, a kind of a ubiquitous plant worldwide, but really key for, for bees, and sometimes called the spring yellows. So a mixture of, of dandelions and also the mustards are that time of spring yellows, and um, you know, you'll hear beekeepers say, if your hives aren't building up when the spring yellows are on, something's going on, because there's lots of pollen and nectar out there from these plants. Let's look at a non-honeybee example. So this is star magnolia, although sometimes bees will visit magnolias for pollen. But I wanted to talk about the coincidence of star magnolia and the hatch of the eastern tent caterpillar eggs. So in the top image, you'll see that kind of gray, foamy mass. That's how eastern tent caterpillars overwinter in that, in that um, egg mass. So in the spring, around the time that star magnolias come into bloom, those eggs will hatch out. The larvae start to crawl around. They find a place in the crotches of branches of cherries and apples and other fruit trees. And they'll start these webs, and they'll start to defoliate um, uh, some of the leaves and, and buds. Okay, So these are insects that are definitely temperature dependent, and their development relies on that accumulated degree day heat. 
so if we if we see uh, we see the star magnolia in bloom, then we start to scout, and we know that we're going to see if we can find those egg masses. We're going to see eastern tent caterpillar eggs hatching, or we're going to um, notice the development of those webs in branches. Serviceberry then comes into bloom a great native tree, which actually has a great phenology connection as well. Uh, maybe you know that the name serviceberry comes because at the time that serviceberry is blooming in spring, it's when the ground finally thawed. And so friends and family, these are, you know, in olden days, friends and family that we lost over the winter um, could then, we could, we could dig the grave and have the service, uh, serviceberry, for, um, for those friends and family. It's also sometimes called the shad bush. And that's because the shad, the fish, are running at the time when the serviceberry is blooming. So some other phenological uh, relationships with this plant. And here we are just to check in with the calendar, around 169 growing degree day units. Uh, it does matter which kind of tree. So I have serviceberry in general. We have apple serviceberry. Um, we have Allegheny serviceberry, so as you're doing your own observations, it's really important to know which plant you're dealing with and even which cultivar. If you're looking at, say, lilacs or another plant that has a lot of different cultivars like crab apples, it's helpful to know which cultivar you're looking at because there is quite a bit of variation of uh, bloom dates or bloom time in those uh, cultivars. Here's redbud in bloom. And that blooms around the same time that gypsy moth eggs are hatching. So the gypsy moth eggs are in that um, kind of foamy white mass. See stuck there to the tree, and then the little larvae have hatched out underneath. And so the timing of that is around the time that red bud is in bloom. Apple and crab apple in bloom. We have a, a, a huge crab apple collection and study project here in Worcester. And we, uh, before the tornado, we had a lot more, but we had a tornado a few years ago that took some of our crab apples. But we've always had this tradition of slow driving cars on Mother's Day, um, bringing mom and grandma to Secret Star Arboretum to see all the crab apples. So I wanted to mention this because of some of the implications of climate change. As we know, our season is getting longer. We're usually uh, warming up a little earlier in the spring. Uh, we may be going a little further into the fall. And so we've seen that that calendar indication of Mother's Day as the time that the crab apples are in bloom is not um, so reliable anymore. We're now seeing closer to May 1st is when we're seeing the kind of crab apple peak and time to get mom or grandma and put them in the car. Head to Worcester. Here's common lilac, not a bee plant at all, but a good indicator of the time when pine needle scale eggs are going to hatch. Um, scale is an insect. In this case, it's a, a what we see here, these white flecks, are the dead carcass of the female. So if you see these on your plant now in Ohio, um, this is actually dead on the outside with um, lots of eggs underneath that uh, waxy covering. So if we sprayed a pesticide, for example, right now, it would have no effect because that insect is already dead and the chemical couldn't penetrate to kill the eggs. So we have to wait for those eggs to hatch out into crawlers, which are really easy to spray off with a jet of water, to use a, an insecticidal soap or horticultural oil or a labeled um, synthetic pesticide. So if we know that timing, we know that uh, lilacs bloom around the time pine needle scale eggs hatch, then that's our good um, indicator to go out and start to scout for those. Tulip poplar, a great uh, bee plant, so we're coming further along in the spring down to blueberries. Um, and white clover, that great nectar source. Also sweet clover, our biennials. And black locust, which as beekeepers you know, it's a great um, honey, but it's not a real reliable bloom. We can have a lot of variation from year to year on, um, on the bloom on the black locust. And just checking into the calendar here, we are at first bloom of black locust around 467 garden degree days. Elderberry, we have a couple shrubs that are blooming in summer that are important for bees. So here we have elderberry, um, oak leaf hydrangea. Um, this comes in at about 835 growing degree days. And the, the showy flowers that we see on the outside are actually sterile, um, but the, the pollen-bearing flowers are back tucked in that panicle 
and you'll often see bees back in there working the flowers on the inside. Little leaf linden, a uh, great bee plant, uh, really are relied upon by all kinds of bees. It also happens to coordinate with Japanese beetle adult emergence. So I use this a lot when I'm training gardeners and how to scout for Japanese beetles. So we watch those little leaf lindens. When they bloom, we start to look for those early emerging Japanese beetles. Those early adults are the scouts, and they're looking for tasty plants in your landscape to set up shop. And so we train gardeners, if you, you know, watch the linden for the bloom, then you look for the first beetles, you collect and kill those first beetles, and you're usually able to pretty substantially reduce your local population, your garden population, of Japanese beetles from that early um, detection and killing of the scouts. Basswood, a great uh, relative of that little leaf linden, a native plant, a native forest tree, a great uh, honey plant, a wonderful um, scent to that flower. Then buttonbush, a native wetland plant. Bush honeysuckle, another native that uh, we see lots and lots of bees on. We use it here in the arboretum as kind of a ground cover plant, uh, mass planting, and lots and lots of honeybees and other bees on that deer villa. Sumac and Rose of Sharon kind of bring us to the end of summer time. So we ch again check into the calendar. You see we're all the way up to uh, 1,347 growing degree day units that have accumulated. And this is about where our calendar ends. Um, after this time, we usually think about day length as being a trigger for uh, the blooming of some of our later season plants. So seven sunflower, a great bee plant later in the season. It's a honeysuckle relative, non-native, but a great uh, magnet for bees. And these are some of the, the plants I talked about use more of that day length trigger. So the asters, um, the joe pie, um, joe pie weed, the goldenrods that are so important to get bees uh, into the winter well fed. So back to the phenology calendar. We um, wanted to, to uh, validate the sequence of bloom that Dan had demonstrated in Michigan and also in Ohio. And so in 2003, we developed this network across the state of about 40 identical gardens, planted with trees, shrubs, and then we added in some perennials which we had mon volunteers monitor in each of those locations. A lot of them were at Arboreta or uh, Botanical Gardens, Extension Offices, Fairgrounds. Uh, they would monitor first bloom and full bloom for all of those plants. Uh, we had a graduate student who did her master's thesis on this work and showed really excellent correlation of um, the sequence of bloom across the state through all of these plants. Uh, this is the image that didn't show up. I don't know why, because it's just um, some really nice native uh, perennials. So let me go to this one just to, um, the last picture was just to talk about, um, to show you some of the perennials that we're adding in to this network, um, into the Ohio network. We have about a dozen native uh, perennials that we're adding into these gardens that will track for span of bloom. So rather than first bloom and full bloom, we're interested in how long is that bloom available to bees, because that's what beekeepers want to know. And also gardeners and farmers who are trying to build bee habitat, how long are those different plants blooming, and how can we put together um, you know, a, a sequence of different flowers that are going to bloom throughout the season. So we're going to be tracking that span of bloom, and then next year we'll start to, uh, to uh, collect data on bee visitation to those plants. So which bees are we seeing? And we're, we're kind of modeling this off some citizen scientist um, studies that are done in other states that look at, you know, are we seeing honeybees or mason bees or bumblebees or other bees on these different plants. Our network gardens also have this uh, lilac, the red rothamagensis Chinese lilac. And um, this is a, a lilac that was actually uh, cloned and distributed throughout North America. And you can see there from the National Phenology Network map all the points across the continent that have um, these lilacs planted. So we have volunteers who've been collecting data since the 60s on bloom time for, um, for all this, this lilac information. And they have that um, data all indexed here on the National Phenology Network 
website. And you can actually go in and create an account and track your own plants through Nature's Notebook. Another citizen science project is Project Budburst, and um, this is put out by the, uh, uh, coordinated through a, a grant to the Chicago Botanical Garden. And again, you can go in, create your own account, and decide which plants you'd like to monitor. They have some favorite plants that they are requesting data on, but you can also pick from a lot of wildflowers and native trees and weeds and um, a lot of garden plants in this network as well. They have some great maps, too. So I happened to pull up the Red Maple map. These are live maps. And for 2014, there's not so much happening yet. You can see here from the image that uh, for Red Maple, there are some um, points on the, um, some pins on the map. And you can see where Red Maple's already come into uh, first flower. And you can follow that progression then as the season unfolds. So it's really neat to, to be able to watch with their live maps. And they have a number of different species that they track. So just a, a couple thoughts on creating your own calendar. Um, if you live in Ohio, you, um, you, know, you have easy access then to the Ohio Phenology calendar. You can put your zip code in, and you get that sequence laid out for you. If you live in a nearby state, you can kind of guesstimate, you know, are you more like Cincinnati than Cleveland, and put in a, a zip code just to be able to follow kind of ground truthing what's happen, happening around you versus what the calendar says is happening in an Ohio city. If you're um, a little further from us and you don't have similar plants that are in our calendar, then some ideas for how you can create these observations and um, kind of create your own sequence. So one way to, to do that is to use your own photographic records um, to um, create some maps, some sequencing of what you're seeing through the season. Um, I actually like a pen and paper record, so I carry a little uh, moleskin with me in the car all throughout the, the um, the growing season, the spring and summer. And so if you look at this moleskin, I've opened it up, and on the right-hand side, you'll see that on a, um, a day when I didn't have much to do in winter, obviously, I kind of wrote out every sequence in our Ohio calendar. So at the top, I have Bradford Calorie Pear, FB for full bloom, Allegheny Serviceberry full bloom, Saucer Magnolia full bloom, PJM Rhododendron full bloom, uh, we can, weaving cherry, full bloom, and then boxwood salad, and so on and so on. And so on the right of this, on the right page of this notebook, all the way through, from the first bloom of silver maple through the um, bloom of rose of Sharon, I've written all these events out. And then what I do on the left is other observations that I notice that I'm interested in. I write down what's blooming at the same time. So you can just see that at the same time Allegheny serviceberry was in full bloom, I noticed the first bloom of garlic mustard, yellow rocket was in full bloom, yellow epimedium was in bloom, and sugar maple was in full bloom. So then later I can go back in and put this into an Excel file, and I have my own kind of personalized calendar of what I see blooming when. And so even if some of these plants aren't as common in your area, um, you know, there's one at an arboretum, but there's not one in your neighborhood that you can track you can kind of link that bloom with something that is in your yard um, to make your own kind of personalized sequence. Um, another way to do this is through an app like Evernote. Evernote is a free note-taking and um, kind of uh, um, indexing sort of, of app that I use on my computer as well as on my phone. And you can use this vJournal app. Of, uh, it's a product of Evernote. It's free. And what you do is you take a picture and then you upload it um, as a daily observation. So I was excited. I know it doesn't look like much, but it's the uh, first crocus bud that I had seen. had to have some little hope of, of spring coming. So I got out my phone. I took a picture. I uploaded it through the Evernote. And it was pulled automatically into Evernote in my journal um, notebook. So then every time I take that picture, I have a timestamp. It also... You can't see there, but it has a map location, so it's pinning the GPS location for all of those plants. And um, you know, so I have this great record, and I didn't have to do much note taking whatsoever. So maybe an idea for you as well, if you have apiaries in a lot of different locations, um, you have you know a number of different hives at different locations that you're trying to keep track of. You can use this photographic record to uh, keep your notes because I know it's hard when you're out there. You've got your equipment and. And, you know, you don't, you've got a lot of work to do, so you don't necessarily feel like taking a lot of, of notes. But if you can snap a, a quick picture and then fill in some information later, 
You can also reconstruct a record from photos, and I was talking with a photographer about this a couple weeks ago. So here's an example of a um, Stewardia tree. It's a, a blooming ornamental tree that was blooming on uh, May 16th in Worcester last year. And so I, you know, I had that in my, uh, my Photoshop record. I had the date pulled up. And so then I could go back to the calendar. I could put that date in and see how many growing degree days we were at around the time that Stewardia was in bloom. So this year, I can look when Southern Catalpa is in full bloom or um, Green Spire Little Leaf Linden is in full bloom. I can be looking for that Stewardia to kind of um, put those together. Is that the right uh, timing for the bloom of that Stewardia? Um, this is what I was talking about, it being important to kind of identify your phenophase or your plant phase pretty specifically. So the first bloom of that Stewardia would have been a better indicator, or if I was up in front of the plant and I could see that one out of 20 buds was still closed, and that could be my definition of full bloom. It's a little um, better of a, a, a timing to pinpoint than just one flower that happened to be open. And I can't really say, you know, how long was that flower open? Had it been blooming for a week or for 10 days, or did it just open that day? But anyway, you can go back and uh, try to recreate some, some records. Okay, I'm going to pop us over There we go. So I turned the, the chat pod on again. If you have any questions, feel free to, to type those in. Um, but I will just uh, kind of end by emphasizing that if you are from another state and you're able to tie in to that state's phenological data, I know Alabama has done some tracking. I'm pretty sure there's some good information in Maine. Um, so some of these records, these sequences, um, the degree day units may be available. You need to be sure to pay attention to what their base unit is. Again, ours is 50. So if you're going just with those degree day units, the degree day units are going to vary depending on that base temperature. Okay, but that sequence should still hold true. So you can kind of play with that, use this year to um, visit our calendar if you're close by, start to take your own observations, and um, you know, get a, get a feel for phenology and how, how it can work for you to study that bloom time. Now, I do have a a beekeeper in Ohio who's really into phenology, and he does a lot of work with data collection and observation, tying the plant events to his maintenance in the hive. So what he's seeing, you know, when swarming is happening and what plants are blooming. Um, so he's really trying to tie the hive um, events and, and maintenance events to um, the phenological year, which I think is a really uh, great extension of that phenology observation. Uh, so uh, let's see. So I'll just grab a question here. Pat um, said that the um, the formula that I showed, the average daily temperature uh, minus the base unit, is that what Ohio uses? Has actually a simplified average, um, and the Ohio calculation is based on a there's a sine wave calculation that uses a lot more um, calculus than um, than I would want to calculate. You can have your computer do that. Ours does it automatically. So it is a slightly different. Um, uh, measure of the degree day unit. Um, so when I have folks who track their minimum maximum temperature at home and come up with their own degree day units, they might be off a little bit from Ohio's calendar because we do the, use that sine wave calculation. Uh, Karen wanted to know if there are any good books on phenology, and I don't know of any books um, there's a, kind of a memoir called Chasing Spring that I really enjoyed. It was written a few years ago um, about a gentleman who um, took off across the country and kind of literally did that, Chase Spring. And um, it's a really neat kind of observation of what he was seeing as he traveled across and north and south through North America. I will post when I put this recording on the website and the handout, I'll also link you to, um, well, let me put it in the, the chat pod. So if you go to... Uh, go.osu.edu is our shortcut, and then phonology. Make sure I spell it right. So if you go to go.osu.edu slash phonology, I have a, um, a web page built there, and I have some of my PowerPoints in it. I have a couple links. I have a link to our calendar. I have a link to a handout. I'll put a link to 
a chapter that Dan Herms wrote for an IPM manual in Michigan that's really good. It really describes the process of how degree days are calculated, shows that Michigan data, shows the Ohio data, and really gets Dan, Dan's perspective on how that phenology is so useful.